Let's make sure that we have our chat open. Let's make sure that we have our waiting participants open. So we're recording. Um, I have two in the waiting room. Um, All right. And uh, so I'll add them. Uh, uh, Kishi, if you don't mind, just handling till the intro. Uh, sure. I'll wait a couple of minutes for more folks to join. Yep, no worries. Here we go. Hi, who was that? Gilles. Hey, Gilles. Bonjour. Bonjour. <laughs> Ça va? Bien. That's, that's as far as I can go. I, I got to go back to Italy. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good, though. <laughs> oh. Glad, uh, glad you're able to join. It's been a while since we caught up. Yes. Good to see you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Always good to see you as well. <laughs> so yeah, let's give it a, a few more minutes before we start. We have uh, yep. folks on now. It's a Saturday morning in Singapore, so uh, a bit early <laughs> still. Give some folks some time. Hey, Kishi, I'm back. All right, excellent. Yeah, it's uh, five, six past. You want to wait a bit more? Or you want to just uh, start with the intros and, and jump in? Yeah, you know what? We might as well uh, start with the intros. Give me one second. Okay, great. Yep, I think we might as well start. I uh, want to thank everyone for uh, attending today's meeting. Uh, what you'll notice is that I'm going to be looking at the screen and to my right. It's not that I'm distracted. 
I just got two monitors going on, so which is uh, which is, explains me turning my head sideways uh, occasionally. Um, what what I want to do is remind everyone that today's presentation is being recorded. So if it's the case that you don't want your um, uh, face or your voice to be recorded, just put your video and your microphone on mute. John and Matthew are going to be our presenters today, and they both have quite a bit of background in the crypto space in, in, uh, in a variety of areas uh, from utilization to trading. And they'll be pre uh, presenting a bit of their uh, backgrounds um, prior, to the, uh, prior to the presentation. We'll do everything we can to try to make the, um, uh, the presentation as interactive as possible. Uh, there's quite a bit, a bit of information to get to. Um, attendees do have the ability to raise their hands virtually during the presentation. Um, so if you do have a question while the presentation is ongoing, uh, you can raise your hand virtually. If you have any questions in terms of how to use the application, uh, we have a, 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 the ability for you to send a general chat message to everyone, or you can direct it at myself, and I, I'll, uh, I'll try to address your, your question while the presentation is going on. Um, for any question that you have on a specific slides, all the slides do, will have uh, or do have numbers on them. So if it's the case that we don't get to your to you on a specific question after, until after a few slides, do try to recall which slide um, you're referring to and then we can at least at minimum try to flash that slide when the presenters are uh, addressing your, your question. Um, having said that, I will turn it over to Matthew and John uh, to start the presentation. So, gentlemen, uh, go ahead. So, good morning, and thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, hope we have a really informative session here. And uh, Matthew, if we can go in a little disclaimer here: we are not uh, financial advisors. This is not financial advice. This is just uh, information that we're sharing with you. So, please do. Uh, consult with professionals or whoever you seek for that uh, professional advice uh, before you make any decisions about your own finances. Uh, that said, I think he's already mentioned we're recording, so please be aware of that. So introduction for myself, I'm the director and uh, CEO of Auspicious Agile and Blockchain, uh, which is a uh, fintech blockchain startup. I'm a blockchain enthusiast and investor and uh, founder of uh, the Wakanda meetups, uh, blockchain meetups, which happened in Singapore. And some of you are participants in that as well. I've been a serial entrepreneur and entrepreneur uh, for over the course of my career in technology for about two decades, uh, invest in uh, blockchain. And you can see some of the companies, of course, that I've worked with over the years uh, and do a lot of conference speaking, at least prior to us going virtual. Uh, now we're doing these online. Uh, you can see my background. Of course, I have a computer science undergraduate, a master's from uh, UCLA, and a Juris Doctorate, uh, so I'm a lawyer, but don't hold it against me, uh, from uh, Southwestern Law School. And I speak Spanish and some basic Mandarin. All right, let's uh, go on. Yeah, so uh, I'm Matthew. Happy to be here today. Uh, so I'm American and Nigerian. Uh, so I'm uh, based in Singapore currently, uh, but I'm originally from Providence, Rhode Island in the US. Uh, my discipline is in marketing and entrepreneurship. Um, I graduated with undergrad in uh, 2011 um, uh, at Northeastern University in Boston. I'm a two-time co-founder uh, of a few different companies, um, and I've raised $14 million, uh, in overall funding uh, over the past uh, number of years. Um, and so I just recently got my MBA from the Asia School of Business, which is based in KL, which brought me to Southeast Asia. Uh, there I founded the Blockchain Club, as well as uh, became a member of the MIT Digital Currency Initiative. Uh, Post-grad, I joined a cryptocurrency startup, uh, a crypto exchange called Aluma, based in Singapore. Uh, we operated in India and Indonesia. Uh, so really focused on uh, getting the emerging markets into cryptocurrency. And, and now I, I currently lead product marketing at Grab for the Super App and uh, Ventures, Grab Ventures teams. So my LinkedIn contact, my WhatsApp, and my email are available as well. Feel free to reach out at any time. Uh, handing it back to John to go through the agenda and kick us off. Right, so I'm gonna hop in here and uh, we're gonna basically go through uh, our introduction, which we've just done. We're gonna go into the economics of blockchain. So I'm gonna start there. And then I'm gonna take you into some different use cases that we use for uh, blockchain and um, for cryptocurrencies and digital assets. And then Matthew's gonna take you through how to invest and trade and also crypto regulation. 
And then I'm going to wrap us up with the potential for Africa and developing markets. And at the end, we'll have the opportunity for people to ask questions and Q&A. Please, I see some of you already typing in the chat. Do type in the chat. Uh, I am interested to know just by maybe a single word or so, how much experience you have with crypt chain, crypto uh, currency blockchain. Uh, so you can just say, you know, very little experience. If you can just type one word in the chat box, that'd be great. Just to give us an idea of uh, how much experience you have uh, with uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency and digital assets. I guess I see very little, total beginner, no experience, investor, okay. All right. Okay, so we got nothing. Okay, great. And this is for you guys who have never seen this before. So we want to decide how to uh, gear the presentation. All right, so we're gonna hop in here. Started a month ago with Bitcoin, great. And Ethereum, good picks. All right, and let's go into the economics. Uh, so we're gonna play a little video here for you. Uh, Matthew, we cue it up. When you wanna buy something normally, using your normal bank card, this is what happens. I give my card details to the shop. The shop asks the bank if I'm good for the money. Bank checks its records to see if I've got enough in my account. If I do, it lets the shop know. It updates its records to show the movement of money from my account to the shops. Oh, and it takes a little time for its trouble. Now, if you wanted to remove the bank from that system, who else would you trust to keep those records and not alter them or, or cheat in any way? I wouldn't trust you. You. In fact, I wouldn't trust any single person, but I might trust everyone. The idea is you don't have a central record of transactions. Instead, you distribute many, many copies of this ledger around the world. Each owner of each copy records every transaction. So, to buy something using cryptocurrency, I give the shop my details. The shop asks all the bookkeepers if I'm good for the money. The bookkeepers all check their records to see if I have enough. If I do, they tell the shop and then all update their records to show the movement of money. So there's no way that a forged transaction can make it in. If I try to alter a ledger, it won't match all of the other copies. And it gets rejected. Oh, and one of them, at random, will be given a reward of some newly created cryptocurrency. This is how cryptocurrencies work. And remember, all of these bookkeepers, all of these ledgers, they're not actually people, they're computers. Lots of computers. All right, so that gives us an idea of the, uh, of the blockchain and the economics. So it's really kind of a very new paradigm because we've never seen before, uh, really, I guess up until the very early parts of history, where it wasn't necessary to use a centralized financial institution to do financial transactions, right? So the blockchain allows us to do that, which is a very powerful concept. So I'm gonna give some parallels here to what we call the uh, dot-com boom. Okay, now the dot-com boom, uh, most of you hopefully are familiar with this. This happened back in around 2000. Uh, this is when we had companies like Google and Amazon and all those companies were born, all these internet companies that we now are household names, right? Um, YouTube, you name it. And so we look at some parallels here. So in terms of what's happening in blockchain today, both started with a number of projects and companies, uh, no clear economic value. You talk to a lot of people now, like, I don't know what it's about. I don't know what all these blockchain and Bitcoin companies are doing, right? Many initial projects and companies have failed and many projects have not made it. And that's the same thing that happened in .com boom. But the dot-com boom also produced, as we said, Google, Amazon, Facebook, obviously some of the most valuable companies in the world now. And some of that is probably what we're going to see happen here as well, 
as things play out in the blockchain space and with Bitcoin and digital assets. Now, some differences. The dot-com boom was entered uh, in basically U.S. Silicon Valley. That was the center of it. Uh, and everything really revolved around that, where blockchain and cryptocurrency is global. So I've met people from Poland and Africa and everywhere else who are uh, in this space. Okay? And I'm actually, my family's from uh, Nigerian side as well, uh, like um, Matthew also. Dot com investment, up. Oh. Not quite, thanks. Dot com investment was primarily limited to venture capitalists and uh, institutional accredited investors. So we can see that um, this is a little from a few years ago, actually. We used to have something called ICOs. Now we have something called exchange uh, traded uh, offerings, or we have uh, initial exchange offerings. Uh, but the idea is that you can basically raise uh, capital on the blockchain. So it's distributed anywhere in the world and anybody can participate. Um, there's different forms that takes. Okay. So this is uh, from CoinMarketCap. This is a website I recommend you guys all write down, www.coinmarketcap.com. It's down at the bottom. And this is where I often like to go just to see what the prices are. There are other places you can go. I'm sure Matthew's going to show you a few. Um, but you can see this is pretty close to the current prices. I took this snapshot, I think, yesterday or the day before. Uh, so Bitcoin is just a little under $12,000 currently. Uh, these are the top coins, coins like Chainlink, uh, which has been going up very rapidly. Um, I can tell you, though I won't tell you exact results, that uh, I've been able to make much better returns on my personal investments uh, in crypto and blockchain than in any other space over the past several years uh, because this space has performed better uh, probably than almost any other asset class. And I'll let you guys, don't take my word for it, go check for yourselves. Okay, let's go to the next uh, slide. So where is this going uh, economically, globally? Where are we going? So we see it's very likely that we, as we said, we're going to see the next Google, Amazon, Facebook, big players. Right now we have Binance, Coinbase, uh, BitMEX. Some of these players who are starting to become very big in this space. In addition, it's likely, and it's already becoming this, I was listening to a session this morning, to become the internet uh, money or digital money, money 2.0, if you will. You see our picture here. Uh, new world currency, as it says there on the Economist cover, right? The idea is that what we're looking at with um, Bitcoin, with cryptocurrencies, with digital assets, most banks are now uh, have the right to do custody in the United States for this. Uh, globally, we see central banks looking into this. So we'll see more about that coming up. But uh, this is clearly becoming uh, the potential new currency, at least for the internet and for digital. Okay. So it's a big deal for the developed world, and we'll talk about this a uh, little more in the developing world context later. So many in the U.S. already view blockchain and cryptocurrencies as stock market 2.0, as I mentioned. We have J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs and NYSC and NASDAQ and um, Bank of America, Fidelity, you name it. They're all investing in Bitcoin. In fact, I think it is now, um, there are 10 coins that I believe are listed, I don't want to lie here, on, on the stock exchanges, on the major stock exchanges in the U.S., uh, there's grayscale funds, which you can invest directly into about four to six of the top cryptocurrencies. Uh, so this is really starting to move very mainstream. Now, this is for investors. Um, I think that people on the street may not know it as well, uh, especially in the U.S., although in developing markets, that's different. In addition, all banks in the U.S. have authorized to custody digital assets. So that happened about a month ago. So it doesn't matter if you bank of Wells Fargo or Bank of America or whoever it is. Uh, they actually all now have the authorization to custody or to hold your digital assets and cryptocurrencies for you. Okay, let's go on. So we can see here the digital yuan, digital dollar. There's our friends Trump and Xi walking when better times, I guess, right? So you can see the digital yuan there down bottom left and up top and the digital dollar, which is a little bit behind that. I think the yuan is having kind of a soft launch right now. Uh, but the idea is that basically the world's major powers are moving to a digital currency, right? And a digital currency is basically just a blockchain based currency. Just to give you guys the, uh, the inside scoop here, we say, so here's somebody say digital asset. That's just a fancy word for cryptocurrency. Uh, there are some nuances to that, but that's basically what it is. All right, let's go on. So the rise of Bitcoin. All right. Is there another down click there? 
my trend line. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so you can see that trend line. A lot of people will go, oh, it's such a volatile market. Bitcoin is up, Bitcoin is down, Bitcoin is up, Bitcoin is down. What do we do? What do we do, right? Here's the thing. If you look at that red trend line, okay, and I'm not a market analyst, but just look at the trend line. If you would have bought whatever that was seven years ago, okay, it would have cost you like $50 for a Bitcoin. And you can see back there in 2010, a programmer spent 10,000 Bitcoin uh, to buy pizza. Those 10,000 Bitcoin today are worth about, was it 1.2 million? I don't want to get that wrong. Anyway, that's an expensive pizza. Okay. Now you can see that red trend line, it's just going up. Okay. And I, I can tell you this again, I've been invested in this market for several years now, and I've gotten great returns um, because of that red trend line. I'm an investor, not a trader. I think maybe uh, Matthew and or Keisha can tell you more about trading because I don't spend a lot of time trading. But what, what I want you to see here is that just because there's fluctuation in Bitcoin, you need to look at what the long-term trend is uh, overall. Okay, let's go on. Okay, so continuing up, go back. There we go. Okay, so I wanted to just show, if you look at that bottom right, that little box, which is really small, uh, it just gives you the overall market cap. Uh, and capitalization for Bitcoin. And I'm gonna just take a quick peek here while I'm talking to you guys, give you the current market capitalization. Uh, so current market capitalization for, uh, is about 219, $220 billion uh, for Bitcoin. And for the overall market, it's sitting just under $400 uh, billion. Uh, at the peak, when we had that really big spike there, which you guys can see on my thing, but when we had that spike, uh, it was about 800 billion, I think. And of course the market is continuing to grow. All right, we can go on. So uh, this is a slide that I did a little while ago, but not changed much. Everybody's been jumping on board, uh, maybe not making loud announcements about it, but certainly in the investor community, in the high net worth and community, wealth management community. And I can tell you, I've been you know, speaking in those conferences and in that space for some time. And this is definitely, where the movements are taking place. And especially now with COVID, it's increased because there's so much more digital transaction going on. Okay. So why is it rising? Well, that's a great question. Bitcoin allows anyone anywhere to transfer value from one place to another. I'll give you an example. So like I said, my family's from West Africa, uh, Nigeria, my father's side, and my father unfortunately had a uh, health emergency last year. And we need to get money from, not to, from our family in uh, Africa to the US where my dad stays. And I need to get that to my sister. So I messed around with banks for weeks, literally weeks, doing paperwork, getting money, trying to get that transferred uh, from family to Africa, which is not easy to do, unfortunately. Finally, I just sent her Bitcoin and it took me about literally 10 minutes for the time that I sent it till the time that she received that. Okay. So that's the difference between being able to, especially if you're in a developing market uh, like West Africa or elsewhere, um, it's going to make a big, big difference if you actually have that access to funds and finances. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. That's something that my startup is involved in now uh, later at the end. So there is a limited supply of Bitcoin. There's only 21 million that are ever going to be minted, which means it's going to become more and more valuable and which is why you see that trend line going up, right? Because they're, unlike the dollar, which we can keep printing, 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 um, you can't keep minting Bitcoin. There's only 21 million ever. Now that differs for different currencies. Uh, however, definitely for Bitcoin, there's a cap and for other uh, digital assets or cryptocurrencies, there's also a cap on some of them. Ethereum, I did not think has one right now. There is a limited supply. There are no intermediaries. So like I said, I sent that uh, right to my sister. You know, I just typed in her address and I think Matthew will show you how this works. Um, and I was able to send it right to her. I didn't have to go through seven banks and 10 intermediaries and pay a bunch of fees for that. Bitcoin is stateless, meaning it's not owned by any one country or company. So, or stateless is not the best term. I think it's not, uh, it's not sovereign, right? So it's not owned by any company or country um, or central bank. And that is its power. It's also what scares a lot of people. I'm going to get my headset, so I don't lift up. Uh-oh. Uh, can I mute? Thanks. Okay. And of course, Bitcoin is decentralized and trustless, which means you're not trusting any one person, like you saw in that BBC video. 
a little bit ago. I'm gonna take a pause here. You can either type in the text box or I'm not sure if you're able to unmute. Are there any questions uh, uh, before I go further? Um, I don't see any raised hands, John. I think we can uh, wait. Looks like one message is uh, a couple of messages are coming. Of the ERMB and E dollars slow Bitcoin's growth. So great question. Um, I don't think so. The use cases differ. We're going to go into use cases in a little bit, Mo. Um, but the bottom line is this, is that if um, China, which they are, <laughs> there's no doubt about that with China. If China has their ERMB, right, e yuan and E dollar, we're getting a little slower on that on the American side, but we're still, <laughs> we're working on it, okay? Even with those currencies, the use case doesn't change. The, the E yuan is controlled by China. The E dollar is controlled by America, right? If you are somebody in Colombia, you are somebody in Russia, you are somebody in South Africa, and you want a currency that you can use or you want to store value, not necessarily controlled by those other countries, um, you're still going to want to use Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin's use case has always been that open ability to transact, not controlled by any one sovereign, right? And maybe China's your friend one day, maybe they're not real happy with you the next day. Maybe America's your friend one day, but they're not real happy with you the next day. So you really want something that is uh, not controlled by any one sovereign, and that is one of the big use cases as far as Bitcoin goes. So no, I don't think it's a uh, competition there. Um, they have different use cases. Uh, is blockchain, yep, only used for digital assets or are there other potential applications? Hold on to, um, okay, well that's, we do have a lot of use cases that we'll go through. At a top level, Gerald, um, I will note that blockchain is used for identity management. Um, blockchain can be used for logistics. Blockchain is used for a lot of things, for tokenization. Um, so there are a lot of use cases associated with blockchain. Corporations use it for uh, internal management of data uh, and things like that as well. So there's a lot of use cases besides digital assets, but I, I would definitely say, in my opinion, the most compelling and powerful is uh, the digital asset use case because when something touches the money supply um, and currencies, that is something that is going to have profound effects. But yes, there are a lot of other use cases for blockchain. Okay, any others before we go on? Great questions, by the way. Can I explain STCK? Stock? Stock to flow. Okay. Um, so from a digital asset perspective, uh, I really do not do a lot of engaging on uh, viewing this from that perspective. Matthew or Keisha, do you have any comments on that? I don't know about Matthew, but I'll, I'll probably have to defer to uh... Okay, so why don't we hold that one until the QA? Uh, that was a private one, I guess. That was, uh, let's hold that to the QA at the end. Keisha, if we can just make a note um, for stop to flow, let's talk about that uh, during our QA at the end. All right, let's go on. Oh, we have one more. Will the last Bitcoin ever be minted since it's halved? Yes, it will be. There is going to be continued halvings. I don't remember the exact year uh, when this will complete, but the algorithm actually, I think we have until like 2030 or something. I don't want to lie. Uh, but at that point, you will see the last one. And every time it halves, you get less and less and less supply, which means it gets harder and harder to get more Bitcoin. So the rewards become smaller and the supply that is available becomes less which means of course, when there's scarcity, it becomes more valuable. So yeah, we will mint the last Bitcoin at one point. Absolutely. And that's not too far off. Okay, let's go on. So let's go to our use cases now. Okay, so we talked about, and I talked about here, actually we're sitting about three, 400 billion right now. Uh, on overall market cap. And I think Bitcoin's market cap is sitting around 220 million or billion, excuse me. Uh, in early 2018, when we had that market high, we were at $800 billion. And let's take a look at some of the use cases. Bitcoin, as we said, is a store of value. 
So if you're in Zimbabwe, if you're in Venezuela, if you're someplace with an unstable currency, you can put money in Bitcoin and you store your value. Um, the value is probably not going to go away. Right? Transactions are not very fast, but you can send it to anyone, anywhere. Like I gave you the example with my sister, my family members, and my dad um, in uh, West Africa, in Nigeria, in the U.S. No problem. Okay? Ethereum. Now, Ethereum is used as a platform for distributed applications and smart contracts. So it's kind of like the supercomputer uh, use case of, uh, for the blockchain, right? I actually use these smart contracts in the uh, business that uh, I'm working on in my startup as well. And this coin is the second highest market cap, and that is still true. Um, I did that slide a little while ago, but it is still the second highest market cap of all of them. It gets used extensively. Uh, let's see, Steven says global market cap, yep, at about $372 billion, yep. Okay, Ripple. This is a darling of the banking industry. So if you're looking for the insider coin, uh, not in a bad way, if you're looking for the insider coin, right, this is the one the banks love. Uh, they love Ripple because it's really designed for cross-border payments for banks. Anybody who's used Swift before uh, to do transfers globally, it's slow. It takes a week. A lot of times you got to fill out ridiculous amounts of paperwork. You got all kinds of limitations. Ripple is designed to solve that use case. And there's another one called Stellar. We'll talk about it a little bit later. Bitcoin Cash is meant to be a cash alternative. Another one like that is Litecoin. They're based, both based on the uh, Bitcoin blockchain. So sometimes you will see uh, other coins, either a coin has its own blockchain or token. And a token means that it doesn't have its own blockchain. It's based on uh, the blockchain of another coin. Monero is one of the several privacy coins. Zcash is another one. And these are designed to be untraceable. As you can guess, governments hate these, right? Because they don't, aren't able to track who's paying who and what's going on. So obviously this would be a favorite of somebody, maybe if you're doing something nefarious, or maybe if you just have private things you want to do and you don't want people to know where your money is going, right? So, and actually the value of Monero has been going up quite a bit. If I look here, I'm not going to spend a lot of time looking at the chart, but... I think Monero has actually been going up in value quite a lot lately, which I've been noticing as well as some of the other privacy coins. So uh, definitely people are still looking, yeah, a little movement up there, um, at these privacy coins and this is another use case. Let's go on. So Facebook Libra coin, and I think Matthew asked, he's like, is that still around? So this is a, actually our meetup that we did last year when we were able to meet in person. Uh, we talked about Facebook Libra. This is one controlled by Facebook, you guessed it. Right. And so this basically incorporates and usable by user WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook, Facebook Messenger. Fed regulators in the U.S. were more concerned about it, but I think they're now involved in it. So I don't think they're as concerned anymore. Let's go to the next slide. So you can see kind of the association associated with Libra. I'm not going to go all the way in there. But you got Coinbase and Uber and MasterCard and eBay and Spotify and all of these. Right. So it uh, you can see the latest timeline. Uh, the Libra Association, which is to the left there, HSBC chief, uh, I think has joined, U.S. Treasury, Singapore's Tomasic has joined, San Francisco-based Paradigm, right? So some big names are joining the Libra Association or uh, to be involved with Facebook Libra. If you want to think about it this way, I would consider it the corporate, the corporate coin, okay? So Bitcoin is kind of a independent open source kind of one. Libra is a corporate coin, and then you have some of these sovereign coins like the e yuan and the e-dollar, okay? So that's our corporate coin. All right, let's go on. And the question of whether you trust Facebook to manage your money, that's up to you. Okay, central bank digital currencies. So, da -da 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 -da. okay, uh, question, how did my sister convert Bitcoin back into cash in Africa? Uh, that's, actually, she was in the U.S., but it's pretty easy. You just use anybody like Coinbase, it connects to your bank account and you change it back over. It's pretty mainstream in the US to do that. So it's not hard. Um, we can talk about that a little more though as we go to the Africa section as well. Okay, so central bank digital currencies. This is another area. So the World Economic Forum, they're having big discussions in Davos or wherever they meet. We talked about the EU on, I think that Japan uh, is looking at a digital version of uh, their yen. Uh, we have the Euro and they're looking at theirs, right? So. Central bank digital currencies upside, well, it's gonna be backed by a state or a country uh, or an economic zone. Downside, it's controlled by a state or a country or an economic zone. So 
these are definitely a use case. This is definitely going to happen. Uh, to the question that was asked a little bit earlier, uh, I think somebody asked it in here. I don't see it at the moment. But yeah, this is not the same use case as Bitcoin. Bitcoin is basically, I would consider, free and open currency. Uh, these are going to be controlled. Okay. So this is another use case, Stellar and Ripple. They are actually basically cousins, sisters, brothers, whatever you want to call them. And these actual tokens, uh, like I said, the Ripple is the darling of the banking industry, right? At least when they, it's a love-hate relationship they have, but when they love it, they love it. Uh, on the Stellar side, it was basically founded from the same blockchain, but one of the founders left and started his own. This one is more of a grassroots. It's used in developing markets, uh, Africa, other developing markets. And basically it allows people to be able to uh, do cross-border transfers with some stability of the value or predictability of the value. Uh, it uses a consensus protocol, they call it. Uh, but basically it is very similar to Ripple. Ripple or XRP as we call it here is the third highest value coin today, uh, still is. Uh, so it's been up there in terms of market cap. And Stellar, I think is a bit lower, is not a darling of the banks. It's about number 14 right now. Uh, so it is also, but its use case is different. It's an open ledger. Uh, a Ripple is controlled by the, basically a single authority basically. And Stellar is open and open source grassroots community focus. So two different coins that are both focused on the cross-border transfer use case. Let's go on. Another one I like, by the way, is Cardano, um, which is also for developing markets. <clears throat> we can talk about that a little bit later in the Q&A if you have questions on that one. Okay, so decentralized finance. This is a big space right now, um, really blowing up. Uh, so the idea is I wanna be able to make money while I'm holding my crypto or my digital assets, right? So I might use some of the big names or MakerDAO, Compound. Uh, there are many others. The idea is that you can take your uh, crypto and you can either make loans and make interest on it, uh, or you can, you know, you get a fiat collateralized one where basically you get one-to-one -one against fiat or a crypto collateralized where you have to over collateralize. You got to put more crypto into your account um, because of fluctuations in value or the fiat is more stable. Uh, but the idea is I can make interest, 5%, 10%. I'll be honest with you, I really have not done this very much yet. The reason is because I've got to take my digital assets, my cryptocurrencies, and put them on somebody else's platform. Uh, and I don't like to do that, right? I like to hold on to my own assets. And due to that, um, I don't use this very much, although I've been looking at it. Uh, I'm not sure if Matthew, I think he's, he's looked at it a little bit. I'm not sure if he's used it. But this is a way that you can make some additional money on your crypto while you hold it. And it is very hot right now. Okay. Another use case here is U.S. banks. They now have the green light to custody, right? So we talked about this and this may seem like, ah, oh, that's not a big deal, but think about it. This means that every bank in the United States and the banks are still making money, even if the main street is not, <laughs> the banks are still making money. Okay. Every bank in the United States, has the right to hold crypto, your Bitcoin, your Litecoin, your Ethereum. So this is meaning basically these cryptocurrencies are mainstream. You everybody go, oh, it's used for crime. It's just used on this and that. Does it make sense that if it was really only used for crime by nefarious people, that every bank in the United States would now be custodying it, right? So I think that's just, let that sink in for a minute, right? Every single bank in the U.S., and I can show you other places in the world as well, now Switzerland, you name it, here we have very good policies as well, has the right to custody and hold cryptocurrencies. So that tells you just how mainstream this is becoming. Again, this is for folks who are kind of wealthy and in the know. <clears throat> for those who are not in the know, they think, oh, there's nothing, this is not really useful. Uh, but believe me, there's a lot of people who are very wealthy who are buying into this asset space. All right, tokenization of real assets this is an interesting one. As I was preparing this presentation this week, I was looking at buying some uh, tokenized gold. I haven't decided either way on this um, because you have to go through a few different exchanges. Um, you'll see this from Matthew in a minute. Um, but you can buy like digits and packs and different versions. Basically, they tokenize gold. They hold a gold in a warehouse or a vault. And it's actually what we call non-fungible tokens, which means your token is related to one specific piece of gold. Okay, so 
when you're tied to that piece of gold, you can go in and look at your corner of the gold bar, your gram of gold that's associated with your token. It is not a, oh, I just exchanged it. It's actually tied to a specific, basically serial number identified um, gold bar or gold gram or whatever it might be. So we can also tokenize real estate. We can tokenize artwork, right? Um, you can own land in Manhattan property in Africa, other places, right? So you can uh, use tokens now to buy pieces of things that maybe you couldn't afford. Maybe you couldn't afford that Picasso painting before, but now you can buy your own, very own token that represents a fraction of ownership of that Picasso painting, which is custodied somewhere in Switzerland or Singapore or somewhere else, okay? So this is a very powerful use case is developing. Uh, we're actually looking at this in our startup as well uh, to potentially, um, potentially used for assets in the African continent. Let's go on. So another use case here that Matthew had me add, which I think is a good one to look at, is stable coins. Uh, I will tell you the only time I use stable coins is if I'm taking funds out of the market. Um, but the stable coin basically is pegged to an underlying currency. Uh, all of these are dollar stable coins. You have USDT, which is Tether, uh, USD coin, which in Coinbase they use this one. Paxos, True USD, Binance USD, all of these stay at a dollar. So if you are looking to make money, I wouldn't put my money in stable coins because it's just worth a dollar. However, if you don't want your, your stuff to fluctuate, as long as the dollar remains valuable or the euro or whatever backs it, these stable coins will remain valuable. And let's say you're living in Zimbabwe, let's say you're living in Venezuela, you may actually be able to use one of these stable coins to make sure that your assets don't lose value, even if the currency is hyperinflating, as long as the dollar doesn't hyperinflate, which we hope it doesn't. Okay, let's go on. Okay, so before I go into the next session, and hand it over to Matthew. Uh, any more questions there on this section that we just went through on use cases? All right, Matthew, over to you. Great. Thanks, John. So, hey, everybody. Uh, Matthew here. I'm going to take about 20 minutes or so uh, to show you how to invest and trade crypto. Um, so, this is more of a practical guide for beginners. Uh, feel free to jump in, uh, shout if you have a question or ping in the group. I'm going to go through just the basics and at a high level, um, as well as do a demo of buying crypto as well as trading. So, first, it's important to know key terms. Right? These are there's a lot more, but these are the ones. If you're going to be investing, you need to understand. Uh, the first and most important is that there are public and private keys, uh, which is the way that you uh, can access and manage your crypto assets that are on the blockchain, whichever blockchain you choose. So your public address or your public key is actually your public address. It's where you can uh, send uh, assets, right? Assets can be transferred. Uh, the private key is the actual uh, means for you to access and send or spend those assets, right? So you need both, right? Your public key acts as your sort of address, which I'll touch on here, and your private key is actually the key to get in and take and move those assets. Um, and that's important because the custody of those private or public keys um, is important, and I'll touch on that when we come to wallets. Again, a wallet is software built on top of a blockchain that enables you to store, send, and receive assets. This is a sort of software infrastructure uh, that is built on top of a blockchain, uh, built on top of a blockchain, it allows you to access uh, your, your, your funds. The address, as I mentioned before, it's based on your public key, but it's actually a hashed alphanumeric character set uh, generated. Uh, you can generate a single address, multiple addresses um, that actually allow uh, folks, uh, others to send you uh, an asset to your uh, wallet. And of course, an exchange for those who are traders or investors are very familiar, but uh, an exchange is basically a you know, platform where uh, it's a marketplace. Uh, of course, there are tons of different exchanges across the world for cryptocurrency, and I will touch on a few um, and the different types. So in terms of investing strategies, these are nothing new, but they all they are uh, the these strategies are nothing new for for investors, um, but they're a bit different in the crypto space. So the first use case uh, for investing is savings. Uh, this is somewhat of a newer use case. Um, uh, John touched on uh, DeFi or de decentralized finance which is sort of a form of savings and investing. Uh, but savings generally is a strong use case. I put a lot of my savings in crypto now, uh, whether that's a good or a bad thing, you have to be 
yet to be determined. It, it is, of course, a higher risk than going to a traditional bank or a custodian, uh, but it has high annual percentage yield, typically from five to 12%, uh, which, is, which is much higher than uh, what you would get at a typical bank. Uh, there are flexible and locked options, so you can have a flexible ability to take out your crypto um, and use it whenever you want, or you can lock it in for a longer period and receive a higher APY. Uh, there are regulated options in this space, uh, and of course, there are unregulated options. Uh, I would suggest using regulated options, um, which provide you more security in the, in the case of lost or, or stolen or, 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 or lost or stolen funds. The, other, the second strategy is uh, HODL, which is a uh, term to describe hold, uh, a hold, a buy and hold strategy. The crypto, cryptocurrency is a child of the internet, so with that, it comes with a lot of fun and quirky parts. Uh, one is HODL, uh, which is uh, the genesis of this term is from a Bitcoin talk forum, the original Bitcoin forums, uh, where a investor back in 2013, I believe, was drunk and wrote a bunch of uh, messages uh, talking about hodling. Uh, and that became the term for people who hold cryptocurrency. So if you, ho if you buy and hold, you're a, you hodl and you're a hodler. Uh, this is, of course, a long-term accumulation strategy uh, and basically more fundamental analysis. You look at a coin, you look at their white paper, you look at the token economics, uh, you look at the team, uh, you look at the market that they're, they're targeting. Uh, this is more like the sort of traditional startup investing in the sense that you're looking at the, uh, the opportunity that the, that's being presented from this, this token. Uh, and then you would buy and hold for a long period of time, uh, hoping for a higher, uh, higher return when the market, when the price of the coin goes up. And of course there's trading, which is day or swing trading. Um, this is their short-term strategy, say intraday. And uh, this is more focused on technical analysis. And so there are really generally two schools of investors in uh, crypto. You have the hodlers, uh, who are sort of the, the believers uh, in crypto. John, I would consider to be a hodler. Um, and of course, there are great gains you can see from keeping crypto for long term. Then you have traders, uh, more so something I'm interested in, I follow, uh, which there are a lot of technical uh, traders out there. Um, I'll show you some resources to follow there. But you can see uh, with the volatility in crypto, there's a lot of, there's a huge opportunity to make quick gains. There's also a, a, a very uh, real downside risk of losing your money quickly. So these, these are all uh, the sort of investing strategies, and there are a few more, but I, I will focus on these as your, your, your initial thoughts for investing in crypto. So the first thing you need to do is follow the market. John showed the, 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 the coin market cap previously. Uh, my resource, the one I check more frequently, is called CoinGecko. It's linked here, and this is for crypto market capitalization. Uh, they're just very similar to coin market cap. They're all relatively similar. Uh, I choose CoinGecko because it has a little bit more research, um, and I like to see the research that's associated with those coins. Uh, for crypto, for blockchain and crypto news, you can check Coindesk, among a lot of other sources, but I find Coindesk over the past five plus years has been the most consistent source, uh, understanding the crypto market, understanding the blockchain market, and providing the best, most reliable news. Um, I check Masari or Masari Capital for crypto-specific news and analysis. Now, this is more on the fundamental and technical side, um, and they actually uh, have a paid service and a free service. I use the free service. Uh, they have a great newsletter they send every day that actually talks about some of the trends, uh, some of the analysis that's happening in the market. Uh, I actually think Masari is one of the best uh, and brightest stars uh, in the crypto space. Um, they're, they're sort of like the uh, standards and poor or, or one of the more traditional uh, houses that, that are looking at traditional markets. Masari is, is, in, the, is in the elk of those. Um, and then I've also created, a, I think social media is a huge piece of this, this, this space. Um, there's lots of ways to, to get involved in social media. Telegram is a great one, a place to follow projects, uh, follow traders, etc. cetera. Uh, all of that sort of aggregates on Twitter. Twitter is uh, a huge piece of Twitter is crypto Twitter. Uh, I've created a, a, a list called Crypto Watch that I've shared here. It's a curated list of crypto news and traders uh, that show technical analysis. So that's a really great place to start. I've curated over the past year and a half. It's not a big list. It's about 22 people <laughs> to follow. Uh, I, I actually curate it very closely to ensure that we actually get, I actually get the right info. So that's a, that's a list I think uh, would be useful to check out. And then from there you can explore, uh, of course, uh, other crypto related folks on, on Twitter. And I, I definitely recommend Twitter to be the source that you guys take as sort of breaking fast information on, on, uh, on crypto. <laughs> so let's talk about exchanges. So there are three types of exchanges. Um, the first is local, uh, local and large crypto to crypto exchanges. Both these are centralized. Centralized meaning that there's a single company, entity, institution that actually acts as the intermediary. Um, the third exchange is decentralized. Um, and decentralized exchange has no intermediary. It actually just relies on uh, transactions by smart contracts or uh, automated uh, transactions that link and link buyers and sellers. So there is no middleman. So, so starting with local exchanges, uh, typically focus, uh, local exchanges focus on fiat to crypto. These are what we call fiat on-ramps. 
Uh, these are exchanges that are you know, typically regulated uh, in your country or your or where, where you are um, that will allow you to, to transfer your exchange your local currency to cryptocurrency. Uh, they tend to have all the major pairings, so that's Bitcoin to say Ripple, Ethereum, Litecoin, etc. Um, but there's also varying liquidity in the sense of how many buyers and sellers are, are at that within that market, um, and that can also affect the price. Uh, that's with that being said, there are really big local exchanges. I, I will do a demo on Coinbase in a bit. But Coinbase is one you can always recommend. Uh, they've been around. They're regulated in the U.S. They also operate in uh, the U.K. Uh, I believe the U.K. and Singapore. Um, Kraken is another exchange based out of the U.S. Uh, they also operate out of the U.S. U.K. Uh, EU as well. Um, and then local in Singapore and Malaysia, Southeast Asia region is Luna, um, which is. Uh, quasi-regulated in Malaysia. I'll touch on regulation because it's a bit of a gray space, but your local exchanges are really how you take your, your, your fiat currency and transfer it to crypto. Uh, and once you have your crypto, uh, once you have your crypto, you would typically move to a larger exchange uh, to trade one cryptocurrency for another. Uh, there's, there's definitely specialization from a local to a large exchange. The large exchanges focus on getting a lot of pairs, right? Um, so that you compare to all different types of coins. I think last checked, uh, Binance has over 1,200 pairs of tokens. Um, and so uh, other exchanges uh, like KuCoin, which I mentioned here, they position themselves as an exchange that uh, lists new tokens, right? the first exchange to list new tokens. So a lot of folks who are a bit more of, uh, take a higher risk tolerance, will go to an exchange like KuCoin and, and invest early into a token that just got listed. Um, and so typically these exchanges are not regulated. They may have regulation in like a small jurisdiction like Malta or Gibraltar, but uh, generally across the board, um, they're, they're not regulated in your local uh, jurisdiction. So again, Binance is uh, the sort of biggest exchange in the world in terms of market uh, value uh, going through the exchange. Uh, KuCoin is quite uh, big as well. And Huabi, uh, which is initially based out of China, is also quite large. And finally, decentralized exchanges, which are DEX, as I mentioned before, again, becoming very, very popular. Uh, John touched on Compound. Compound is a protocol, but it's also an exchange because the protocol allows users to actually trade uh, one currency to another between uh, peers. So again, the, the value here is there's no centralized authority. It's highly secure because you actually aren't putting your assets in one place. The traders aren't putting your assets in a, in a, in a, centralized, uh, in a centralized authority. It's actually each person owns their assets, the contract is executed, and the assets change hands. So it's highly secure. Uh, because of that, it has very low liquidity typically because there's not that many traders who are actually using these platforms yet. Um, that is changing over time. Uh, Uniswap is a new exchange that came out uh, this year, uh, which has become sort of blown up and, and then sort of the, the, the fuel to pushing decentralized finance. Uh, there's also Compound, as John mentioned, and Kyber Network, uh, which initially launched uh, out of uh, Singapore. Um, and these are all uh, uh, decentralized exchanges, uh, but also coins in themselves. So let's talk about wallets, which is storage. So there's a couple different ways, types of store of wallets, and they all vary on levels of risk. So starting with high risk, uh, we have hot wallet, warm wallet, and cold wallet. Uh, some would consider a hot and a warm wallet to be the same thing. I don't, and I'll tell you why. Uh, a hot wallet it has the highest risk profile. So a hot wallet is typically a free wallet uh, that's stored online. Uh, your keys, as I mentioned before, your public and private keys are held by the third party, meaning that they have access to all of your funds. Um, they're super easily accessible, and, but they have very low security. Uh, and, and that's the typical example of a hot wallet would be an exchange, right? Coinbase, Binance, uh, because you, when you open an account on an exchange, they create a wallet for you, but they own that wallet. It's just they're, they're, the custody of it is with them. It's your wallet, but you have to access it through their platform and all of the funds, all of the custody, all of your keys are held by the exchange. So if the exchange gets hacked um, or if you lose access to your exchange account, or someone takes your exchange account, uh, you have you, your, your funds are completely at risk. The, the middle uh, here is a warm wallet. And this is where I keep most of my funds when I'm not trading, uh, as well as the cold wallet at times. But the warm wallet is a typically free. It's typically a software based, uh, software based that you can download on your phone or your, on your computer. Uh, the keys are stored on your device um, and are held by you. Um, the funds are still held by third party in the sense that the funds are still within that wallet. Uh, that wallet is not owned by you, the keys are owned by you. Uh, it's easily accessible and has medium security. So this again is desktop and mobile wallets. I would recommend the wallet that I use is called Exodus. Uh, it's quite good. Uh, 
it also Electrum. This is specifically a Bitcoin wallet, but also has very high security. I'll call this a warm wallet. You own your keys. You can, you can link to cold storage. Um, these are the wallets that, that I use. Um, and I think I'm pretty satisfied with them for the time being. You also have the option of creating a, of going down the path of a cold wallet, um, which is basically offline, right? The, the, also, the level of uh, connectivity to the internet uh, is directly associated with the level of risk. So a cold wallet is offline. Um, it's typically will pay for the cost of a hardware, hardware like a Trezor or a Ledger. Um, and those are physical devices that act as physical wallets, right? They're not connected to the internet, but they're electronic, which means you can add, uh, transfer your crypto to the wallet right, and keep that ledger, uh, that, that hardware uh, in a safe or someplace safe um, and be able to access that when needed. Uh, so uh, the keys you can are stored on the device. You can also store your keys on paper wallet. The classic old school way is writing down your private and public keys. Uh, knowing how to access the blockchain through various methods and being able to access it when you need it. Um, again, the, four, the funds are stored offline. Relatively difficult to use and you have to actually go in and transfer your funds to a warm or hot wallet to actually trade or, or, or use them, um, but it's the most secure method. Uh, the cool piece here is that there are some really great hardware startups uh, like Trezor and Ledger, uh, which offer some, some pretty cool uh, cold wallets. Uh, other piece here is that both Exodus and Electrum uh, have options to connect directly, I believe, to Trezor wallets. Um, so you can actually have a best of both worlds where you have a cold wallet, but you also can access it through your, your warm wallet software. Uh, so yeah, this is a lot, but uh, I would say just if it's new to you, uh, jump in and just do some of your, some of your own research. Uh, but again, this is important to understand the difference between the types of wallets. Uh, Gerald, let me talk, take your question. So, uh, so Gerald asked a question, is it stored offline? How does it connect to other ledgers in the blockchain? So you're, 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 when it says it's stored offline, your transaction, your, 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 the ledger is still on the blockchain, right? Um, when it's stored offline, it just means that there's not connected to the internet, meaning that the only way to access those funds is by accessing the public and private keys, which are on that device, right? So you basically have your ledger, which is always there, but there's no way, there's no way to connect um, the private public keys. So there's no way to extract or change that, your, your, your the ledger. Right. Um, there's no way to transact. So you keep it offline. Even if there's no way to, to transact between the two. Tolu, do you have a question? No, sorry, I don't have. Sorry, did I? It's it's okay. No no worries. So that's the the wallet. A bit of detail on wallets. Um, in terms of portfolio management. So once you do have crypto and you want to actually have some. Some, some, some ability to, to monitor and manage that crypto. Uh, there are portfolio management options out there. Uh, there are two sort of, I'd say platforms that you use. Of course, there's mobile and there's web and desktop. So uh, the mobile apps typically are simple monitoring of percent change in your crypto, uh, your crypto uh, holdings. Uh, the way you actually connect, these, is to connect to these apps is through uh, either an exchange account or a warm wallet. Um, you can also do it manually. If you know what you've bought, you can actually enter that and then see over time. You can also do a manual way. But of course, connecting your exchange or your warm wallet to one of these apps is the easiest way to do it. Uh, so for mobile apps, it's simple monitoring of percent change. That's typically what it is. They focus more on uh, looking at sort of, say, market news, giving you prices while showing you, you know, what, your, what the value of your crypto is. Uh, so these are pretty lightweight. Um, they're really easy to, to download and check. So I use an app called Delta, uh, which shows me uh, my, uh, the balance of my exchanges, um, or Blockfolio, which is a really popular one, though I do recommend Delta. Uh, I've had much better experience there. Uh, web and desktop portfolio management software is much more robust. Uh, so there are two spaces sort of developing here because they're two separate use cases. Uh, so again, web and desktop will give you simple portfolio monitoring. It'll allow you to manage multiple portfolios if you have different exchange accounts or you actually want to manage and separate the funds into portfolios in themselves. Uh, they also provide a lot of trading tools like rebalancing. Um, so allowing you to rebalance your crypto holdings if you have, uh, say, you want to create an index and ensure that you have a specific portfolio balance. Uh, there's tools that allow you to do that. Uh, things like social and copy trading. So there, there will be traders on these platforms that will, sh will allow, some will allow you to say follow a trader, um, giving them, uh, giving the exchange access to your, uh, your, giving the software access to your exchange, which allows you to actually trade the same trades that others make. Um, this is an interesting space. Uh, I've had mixed luck in terms of uh, trying social and copy trading um, because you never know how good the trader really is. And so I actually don't do it very much, but it's an interesting use case and a fun thing to try. 
Um, and of course, there's trade history and tax estimates. Uh, so it will, it will track your trade history as well as uh, your, uh, your sort of, some will provide you a tax estimates in terms of what you may or may not owe based on the jurisdiction that, you, that you've selected. So uh, web and desktop mo uh, portfolio software, I would recommend Shrimpy. Uh, this is sort of new, it's been around for about a year and a half, but I've, I've seen them do some great development over time. And I, I in fact think they're quite good. Uh, second to that, I would do coin tracking. That would be specifically for tax index, more on, on managing uh, taxes in terms of uh, monitoring the trades that you make and ensuring that they can show uh, what your taxable, uh, the taxable amount that you owe based on your jurisdiction. Um, okay, so those are portfolio management. So quick public service announcement, uh, whether you are signing up for an exchange, you have a wallet or you're using portfolio software, uh, always set up two-factor authentication, meaning that you're not, you don't just rely on a single password entry, you set up a backup or a way to get into your account uh, that adds a level of security, whether that's SMS to ensure that it's you or using an authenticator like Google Authenticator. Uh, most software uh, will ask you to set up 2FA, all have the option, I highly recommend, I think this is table stakes. Uh, you should always have 2FA set up and you should always write down or have a way to access your account in case that 2FA is lost. Cool, so let's go to a demo. Are there crypto ETFs? Uh, that's a good question. I don't invest in crypto ETFs. I, I imagine that there are fast- John, I'll, I'll top in on that really quickly and I'll go, ahead and go back to it. Um, there are not, it's not one that's specifically an ETF only for crypto, but you can uh, invest. There are several ETFs that do invest. Uh, I think uh, ARKK, ARKW, uh, ARK Innovation Fund, those invest in it. And then they invest in the underlying Grayscale funds. Uh, and Grayscale is not an ETF, but it is a fund that invests in crypto. Uh, so those are available on the stock market. And I think Grayscale has put out about five, four or five. So uh, those are some where you could uh, access it through the regular markets. So where do you find someone who can do day trading for crypto? Uh, Priscilla, do, do you mean uh, following other traders? Or is it more how do you access and do day trading? Well, more like how do you access because um, in the past, when I've had persons doing the crypto trading for me, um, they've used Binance and um, I have access to the account and they have access to the account, but you just can't find trustworthy persons nowadays because, you know, it's money that just gets lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's a huge, a huge piece. I've been in crypto for, uh, well, I mean, four plus years. Oh, well, she won that. But... Um, yeah, I think it is an incredibly difficult space to navigate in terms of finding trustworthy uh, folks, right? Even trustworthy exchanges, um, right? So, so I think that's a really difficult one. I would say the default here is to not trust anybody else, is to learn what you need to do yourself. Or if you are going to, make sure that you have in place uh, protocols, um, a way to access and ensure that the, the, the trades that are made are only made when you approve them, uh, that there's certain ways for somebody to trade on your behalf. Um, but I generally would, would not advise that. Um, I would advise just you handing in custody of your own funds and, and trading uh, yourself when you, when you feel comfortable to do so. So let me just do a quick demo. So the first demo will be a how to buy, say, crypto, buy Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Uh, this is exchanging fiat to crypto and how to trade different cryptos. So just quickly, we'll show you how, uh, how, I, how I do so or how you can do so. Not necessarily how I do so. So jumping over to Coinbase. Uh, so as I mentioned before, and Coinbase is, is probably one of the more trusted uh, larger uh, exchanges in the world. It's regulated in the US. It operates uh, in a few jurisdictions across the world, including the UK and Singapore. Um, really good tech. I have some buddies that work at, at Coinbase. Um, and so they're really focused on doing the right thing here. Um, the downfall is that they are based in the US, which, subject, which means they're subject to US uh, law and regulation. Um, and I'll touch a bit on, on, on what, what that means. But generally, uh, once you go in and sign into Coinbase, very simple, very easy to use. You would sign up, create an account. You land on your homepage. Uh, the biggest and largest button they want you to click is trade, which you can do so. Uh, you, oh, come on. They are super smart. Uh, they logged me out after less than a minute. 
Oh, that's an hour. Give me one second. Let me, hold on. Give me 60 seconds and I'll be right back. Okay. Great. So you guys can see my screen, yep? Yes. Awesome. Thanks, Kishi. So yeah, so once you're on Coinbase, uh, you can uh, immediately choose to trade, right? Um, it will ask you to select the amount of crypto that you want to buy. I'm going to buy $10. Uh, you can choose the crypto that you'd like to buy. These are the available coins that Coinbase supports. Uh, there are a number of coins here. They're not, it's not exhausted by any means, but these are, I would consider some of the, the top coins. Um, you would a lot, choose what you like to pay with. I've already set up my bank account. It's as simple as, as going in and connecting your bank account um, here. You can use uh, your debit, uh, bank account, debit card <clears throat> as well. Uh, you can preview your buy. Un unfortunately, Coinbase, the reason why I don't use Coinbase as frequently uh, is because the fees tend to be a bit more absorbent than other exchanges. So if charge a flat fee of $1, uh, that also uh, becomes incremental as, as you go above uh, certain uh, buying thresholds. Uh, but I'll buy crypto now. I want to buy BTC, Bitcoin. It's as simple as it is. I've bought 7,500 sats of, or 7,500 sats of Bitcoin. I can actually trade immediately. I don't have to wait. So I can view my transaction. This is my Bitcoin wallet on Coinbase. And here is my transaction. I bought 251 sats of Bitcoin at almost 12,000. Oh, nice, almost at 12,000. Pretty cool. Uh, this was the account I chose to buy it from, excuse me. Uh, the, the fee I paid, the total amount that I received and the total it cost. So here as well is where you can actually access your wallet on Coinbase. Uh, as I mentioned before, there are addresses. You can actually send and receive crypto to your, any wallet that you have. Coinbase here allows you to send. Um, you can choose the amount that you want to send. Say I want to send $10. I don't think I have any saved addresses. But this is where you would enter your, the destination address of the Bitcoin wallet you want to send it to. You can always associate a note with that uh, transfer. That note doesn't go on, the, the note can go on the blockchain, depends. Um, but that no is for your reference, uh, and then you'll be able to send, right? The, I don't tell you, this is quite a simple interface. Um, one note here is that if you send $10, you won't actually receive $10. There's of course a fee to send uh, your Bitcoin. Uh, that fee is dependent on the uh, sort of transaction fees that are happening within that block, uh, the level of difficulty. Um, and so part of that fee goes to, your, to the miner uh, or goes to multiple miners. So the, the amount that you send, it won't actually be the full amount. If you want to send and receive $10 exactly, you need to add a bit more. Um, and typically, a uh, more advanced uh, interface will show you the amount of the fee. And you can actually add that incrementally to ensure you get $10. Uh, you might need to send 10.05 uh, or something along those lines. So that's how you would send. Uh, so that's how you buy and, and actually access and, and grab some crypto from your fiat. Um, you can do this again in US, the Coinbase, UK, and Singapore. Uh, if you're not in those jurisdictions, uh, check and see uh, what, what exchanges are available for you as well. Uh, I'm going to jump over to Binance. Um, so Binance is, as I mentioned, it's a large crypto to crypto exchange. Um, on Binance, uh, there are an incredible amount of tokens available to trade. Um, you can buy, you trade your fiat currency to cryptocurrency here, but I believe it's limited to using a credit card, which subjects you to a 3.5% fee, which is really a lot of money. So the, this, these exchanges uh, like Binance, larger C2C exchanges, don't index on buying crypto uh, from fiat. They, in they index on trading crypto to other cryptos. 
So if you look at their markets, they have a ton of different markets that link all different pairs, right? So if you're looking to trade your Bitcoin to another token, uh, going to a large C2C exchange is the place to do so. So I'll actually go in and show you how to trade uh, on Binance. Again, quite simple. Uh, you imagine that I sent my $10 in Bitcoin from my wallet on Coinbase to my wallet on Binance. Uh, the reason I won't do this is because Bitcoin actually does take a, a bit of time to send. Um, but uh, imagine that's, that's the case. Uh, once you receive your, uh, in this, your wallet on Binance, you'll see your available Bitcoin. Right. So now on my available Bitcoin, I think I have $18 in this account. This is just one of my, my accounts. Uh, I want to actually trade this Bitcoin for another coin. Uh, actually, some of the coins I've been looking at and interested in is, I think it's actually Compound, which is what John mentioned earlier. So among my favorites, uh, Compound is a, is, a, is a token we mentioned earlier. It's a decentralized uh, financial token. Um, so there's a pair here to trade compound with Bitcoin. The price of compound right now is one, almost 190, which I think is actually quite good. So I actually want to go in and trade for this token. And then as you saw before, I had $18 in my uh, in Bitcoin in my account. Uh, and now I actually want to trade that for compound. Um, I do think that compound will rise over the next few weeks. Uh, it's been up to 225, 230s range um, in the past few weeks. And I imagine it's going to get back to that. So I think this would actually be a pretty good investment. So again, this is the, the Binance uh, sort of interface. Uh, this can be a bit daunting uh, at, at first glance if it's something new to you. It's not very different from other exchanges that you might see elsewhere, but uh, this is the Binance exchange account. They will show you the chart uh, so you can see the trends, uh, the movement, uh, whether that's in candle or you can change it to line, whatever you're more comfortable with. Uh, it allows you to change it to the types of uh, different timeframes from one hour to say 12 hours and see the movement on a longer high time horizon. It also shows you the order book. So the amount of volume that users are, uh, folks are trying to sell, uh, the prices folks are trying to sell. Uh, these, this, their, their tokens, this is compound, uh, and the price that uh, more folks are willing to buy. You also see recent trades. Uh, on, on Binance, you have the ability to choose different types of order types. Um, you have classic, which is market order, saying that you just want to trade a specific amount of, 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 of say Bitcoin for whatever the price is to in the market at this moment, your order will immediately execute it at the market price, the current, the current price, which would be uh, 15,000 sats here. You can also set a limit price, which dictates, hey, I'm gonna place an order on the order books, but only at a specific price, which may be say 1,500 sats, uh, 1,580 sats, uh, rather than 1,800, uh, 864 sats, right? A bit higher, saying that I wanna buy at a higher price. I'd like to buy at a lower price, typically, if I was gonna do a limit order. But since we're doing a demo, I'll just do a market order. Um, the amount of comp that I want to buy, I don't have any comp. So actually I want to sell ETC. There it is. I want to buy comp. I have my market price on ETC. My available BTC is quite low, but I'm gonna buy it anyway. So I place my market order. If I go back to my wallet, I should see that I've purchased, oh, I may have not done it right, hold on. Let's check. Quite slow today, I'm not sure why. Yep, so you can see now that I have purchased Compound and my wallet amount is still 1850, uh, just didn't lose much on the market price. And now I traded my $18 in Bitcoin for $18 in Compound. Uh, so that's as, as simple as it is to trade on, on Binance. Again, just to recap, easy place to get your fiat to crypto is using an exchange like Coinbase. Um, and then beyond that is if you want to trade for tokens that are not available on Coinbase, transfer to an exchange like Binance, uh, go into your wallet, uh, look at the markets that you'd like to, 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 to uh, find the coin that you're looking for, uh, and then go ahead and actually trade, uh, whether you use a market price, a limit, uh, or any other order. Uh, so SATS, so SATS is Satoshi, so it's the lowest uh, amount of uh, the smallest denomination 
that you can get to in Bitcoin. I believe it goes up to 12 sat. I think it's 12 places, um, 12 decibels, uh, decimals. I mean, that sat is the lowest fractional amount of Bitcoin that's available. So, so a lot of times you would say that when you trade in Bitcoin, you might be lower than say $1. Um, uh, and so a sat is the way to talk about those longer tail purchases, longer tail prices. Yeah, so Kishi said it, Sats and Satoshis. Here we do the markdown transaction, they come down, cool. Now, now the chart is confusing. Charts are, charts are somewhat confusing. I think it takes time to, to just uh, get used to seeing them. Um, I also recommend using YouTube as a great resource. There are tons of educational, there's tons of educational content on YouTube uh, that shows you and walks you through at a greater, with greater length and greater detail uh, these processes I went through and actually will break them up into saying reading charts, uh, you choosing the right uh, type of orders, whether that's limit, market, or say trailing stops. Um, and so there's a lot of resources out there. So if this is interesting to you and you want to learn more, uh, I would suggest to, to continue your, your learning journey and, and, and try to do it yourself, uh, but as well as look for more resources. Uh, so I'll jump back into the presentation if there are no question, more questions here. And I'll wrap up by just talking about regulation and taxes. Um, So crypto regulation is a really interesting conversation because it's very much a gray area uh, generally across the board. Uh, there are specific uh, stances that governments have taken, um, but really regulators across the world are introducing cryptocurrency legislations and policies at varying speeds, varying levels. Um, pretty much uh, governments are concerned with things that they can't control, right? And, and one piece I think is incredibly important is security, right? Uh, because we've seen even in Japan, which has regulated, uh, believes that uh, has cryptocurrency as a legal tender as well as an asset class and regulated exchanges, they had the uh, coin check had the largest um, cryptocurrency hack of all time over $550 million was stolen in 20, this is last year. Um, oh, sorry, 2020, end of 2018. So uh, even in a regulated exchange environment like Japan, uh, there was a hack over, over half a billion dollars, right? So these things really scare regulators, scare governments. So the primary concern is figuring out how to enforce and enhance uh, anti-money laundering uh, sort of regulation and policies, uh, anti-fraud, right? You know, uh, Chrisella, as you mentioned, there are there is a lot of just trustworthy people in the crypto space, um, and so anti-fraud is a big piece of figuring that out. And of course, cybersecurity: how do they reduce and eliminate uh, hacks that happen within exchanges? Again, exchanges are central centralized; uh, they're run by a company, people. You have to know who's behind them. You have to know what their policies are and if they're trustworthy. So again, this is a, a, a new space. Uh, so the governments are struggling to find an approach that actually fits crypto with traditional laws and practices. And most likely the, the, the governments that are most progressive are figuring out new ways to, to regulate. And, and create like oh, I was, a, I was watching a podcast. You'll be interested here. Cool. I think we have somebody, is there any questions on the line? Sorry. Uh, Matthew, Matthew, hey. I got a question. Yeah, sure. In regards to the, uh, for, for trading, the bid ask spreads, are they pretty much the same across all exchanges or are some exchanges better uh, uh, in, in terms of minimizing that? Uh, definitely some exchanges are better. I think that's why, you know, when you look at the type of different types of exchanges, um, the, the different type of exchanges, uh, right? So there's varying liquidity at local exchanges. Right, so the bid ask is something can be quite large. Say like a Luno, which is say an exchange in Malaysia, trade trading ringgit for, uh, say Bitcoin. The the spreads could be quite large. Right, uh, Coinbase and Kraken, larger local exchanges, they don't have quite as many issues. But depending on the pairing, right, if you're trying to trade trade something like Bitcoin for comp at a smaller exchange, if it, if it has it, uh, the liquidity might be quite low, and the bid ask could be quite large. And and of course, if you do a market order. You're, you're subject to, to slippage and trying to cover that spread. Uh, for large exchanges, the reason why a lot of users go to places like Binance, KuCoin, Huobi, BitMEX, et cetera, is because there's high liquidity. And, and so that's partly because the, there's a lot of folks buying and selling, but these exchanges also uh, 
contract market makers, users, people, folks who are sort of whales who actually do and make these, make these markets by trading consistently. So uh, definitely uh, liquidity is a big piece here. I, I would always recommend doing limit orders generally um, if you're not in a rush to get into a position. Um, and that should allow you to, to sort of mitigate some of that, that, that slippage. Um, decentralized exchanges, as I mentioned before, uh, there is relatively low liquidity um, because there are, it is, uh, there are fewer buyers and sellers generally in those markets. Uh, you have to have a more a deeper understanding of crypto generally. Um, and so liquidity is quite low in those markets. But again, there are some benefits there in terms of the type of tokens you can buy and what you can do in those exchanges, which may offset the, the cost. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. So yeah, in terms of regulation, uh, so I just put a, a quick view of some of the, the markets I think are people are most interested in and the regulatory stance. So on the strictest side, we have China and I would call it say India as well, which, which don't recognize cryptocurrency as a legal tender and asset. And actually uh, crypto is illegal in the country, right? Um, it's still a gray space. If you're caught with cryptocurrency, you don't go to jail, but it's not considered legal. It's actually considered illegal. And a lot of times when the, the gray space we're talking about is crypto is not illegal, but it's not legal either. And that's sort of the middle ground um, in that gray area. Places like China and India have actually taken a stance to call it illegal. Um, and they have legislation that uh, actually states that uh, close to there, but not as close, not as far, is the US. Uh, so crypto is not considered legal tender in the US, um, but there are exchanges which are regulated um, and you can trade like Coinbase. Uh, there are few exchanges that actually have regulation, few states, it definitely varies on state, New York, California um, are, are two that do have regulation in place, um, but uh, it does vary. And generally the stance in the US and when we get to taxes is uh, I guess somewhat open to uh, cryptocurrency, but as we've seen from the recent administration with Trump and whatnot, uh, there have been uh, active steps to actually uh, try to lower adoption and create barriers to enter this market in the US. Uh, Singapore, perfect middle ground, like Singapore is. <laughs> it's not legal tender, but cryptocurrency exchanges are fully legal and they, they go through the monetary authority of Singapore. Uh, Singapore makes it very easy to actually access uh, cryptocurrency. Um, and the, it, is, it is governed uh, throughout the country by the, 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 the monetary authority. Uh, getting to the more open stance, we look at the EU, where crypto is considered legal tender, uh, although member states have the ability to sort of introduce their own legislation around cryptocurrency. Uh, places like, <coughs> uh, you know, like Estonia, uh, Lithuania, uh, right, they have a bit more uh, lenient stances in crypto. Um, and we can actually see a lot of, uh, a lot of startups and, and, and crypto companies coming out of these, these areas. Um, uh, and then regulation is, uh, exchanges are regulated, but by specific member states, as I mentioned before, like Estonia and whatnot. Uh, these places are a bit more lenient and you see a lot of startups, uh, crypto projects coming out of these areas. Um, and then probably most open, uh, one of the most open spaces, Japan and Australia. So uh, considered legal tender in, is treated as property um, and exchanges are regulated countrywide. Um, so there is varying levels of regulation. Uh, I would suggest, depending on where you live, where you, where you, what jurisdiction you fall under, is to look at what, uh, what exchanges are available to you, if they are regulated or not, and what risk is associated with, uh, with those exchanges. And finally, crypto taxes. So not a fun topic, uh, but you know, governments around the world, they, they tend to want to get their money no matter which way it comes. So uh, taxes on crypto do vary by countries, uh, instance, US, UK, Canada, Australia, they do tax cryptocurrency, while Singapore, Germany, Portugal, others uh, do not, right? So again, you, you have to manage your, determine your tax liability based on your tax jurisdiction. Um, there's also a cost benefit of managing sort of the monetary, how much it costs, these taxes will cost you, and actually managing to actually file or manage your sort of trade history and understanding your tax liability for using crypto. Um, the, the, the part of the most cited resource, I guess, uh, in terms of what ta crypto taxes look like is the, UI, the, in the U.S. The IRS has a notice 2014-21, uh, uh, and it defines what sort of cryptocurrency as property, but it also says by doing so, there are certain taxable events. And so I just want to highlight a few. So taxable transactions, the ones I think are important among others, is any time that you cash out your crypto, it's liable to taxes, capital gains taxes, if that position has been greater than what you bought that crypto for, right? Um, the other one is uh, when you exchange. So anytime you trade, 
for another cryptocurrency, that is a taxable event uh, under the IRS's eyes, uh, guys. So uh, these are two really important points. Um, as I mentioned before, managing and fine figuring out what your tax liability is, is quite a headache. Um, that's why there are portfolio management softwares like Coin Tracker or Coin Tracking, which will do this for you. But again, you have to have your, your transactions go through that platform. Um, what's not taxable, which is nice, is buying crypto from fiat. So what I just did on Coinbase is not a taxable event, um, as well as transferring between two wallets. So if I transferred from my Coinbase account to my Binance account, uh, that wouldn't be taxable either. Uh, so, so generally, I just want to state that taxes is something to be very considerate of. Uh, these taxes are not uh, these taxes are not automatically deducted in the sense that they have to be, um, you as a trader or a crypto investor uh, have to declare these uh, taxes as well. So uh, there, there is uh, the burden falls on you to, to manage uh, that tax, uh, your tax, the tax liability that you owe. Um, generally, I disagree. So I will state that I disagree that taxes on crypto, I think it's uh, an actual sham because it's a digital currency from around the world, uh, access around the world. Uh, and no, no single state is, is contributing and, and, and building these 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 uh, these assets. So uh, again, I think this is a this is a bit of a rub here, but uh, it's something for you to be very aware of. I do track my trade history uh, manually and, and have declared my taxes to the U.S. as well. Um, okay, so that's my my, my time here. Uh, any last questions before I before I pass back to John to wrap up uh, in terms of crypto uh, and potential for for Africa. Yeah, Matthew, I had one question. I'm not sure if, if you're actually the uh, the expert in, in uh, for this taxable question. So if, if you're saying that uh, gains are taxable, does that mean uh, losses can also be used to reduce your, your tax burdens? That's correct. Okay. All right. So it's, it's it would be analogous to uh, gains or losses on, on stocks or, or properties as well. That, as that's, that's, that's exactly where the, the baseline comes from. Okay. Thank you. Sure, so John, I'll pass it back to you. Sounds good. All right, so we're gonna go into now for the developing world. We've talked a lot about in uh, basically the Western world and the kind of developed financial markets. Uh, but one thing we really haven't looked at is how this applies to the developing world. So for much of the developed world, you have easy access to banks, credit cards, finance, right? It's kind of like, hey, should I invest in crypto? Should I use it to buy a latte? Should I you know, look at an ETF, but that's not the case with the developing world at all, right? Very different scenario here. In the developing world, blockchain and cryptocurrency represent the opportunity for people to actually access financial markets where that was not possible uh, in the past for them at all. I described to you earlier how it was very hard for me to do a transaction uh, last year just to send funds um, to family members uh, coming to and from uh, the African continent. And if you look at countries like Zimbabwe, uh, where the currency is in hyperinflation right now, what you're going to see is that Bitcoin uh, basically and some of these stable coins may be ways for them actually to deal with the weak currency, uh, have a way to be able to actually transact and people to be able to eat from day to day. Uh, so the blockchain transparency is also very important because it actually eliminates a lot of potential issues around construct corruption and concerns uh, in the developing world around those types of things as well, because it's transparent, as we talked about earlier, uh, we can see every transaction. And even though you often hear people kind of stereotype and say, oh, cryptocurrencies are used for fraud, they're used for this, used for that. If you really are a criminal, cryptocurrencies are not good for you, uh, because the fact of the matter is, except for a few of the privacy coins, these things are completely trackable. I can track everything you do. So there's no real be benefit for you. You're better off to get a bag of dollars like you see in the movies and go use that for your nefarious activities. Blockchain is actually very transparent, which is a great thing for the developing markets to have transparent uh, transactions. Okay, let's go to the next one. All right, so let's play a little video here. Silicon Valley anymore. This is Kailisha, one of the biggest and poorest townships in South Africa. What are you cooking? I'm cooking the Afghan meats. 
And whether you're into crypto to make money or to save the world, emerging markets like this might be the place to be. My view is that this is where the blockchain should start. In the US or in sophisticated countries, the way I see blockchain is the blockchain is kind of like a fun thing. It's a movement against centralization and it's a fun technology game that everybody's playing, but it's not a necessity. You certainly don't need it. In Africa, you actually need it. The biggest problem, it's nearly impossible here to get or send money. Look around you. There's no infrastructure. There's no ATM yet. How do they get the money? And if you think it's any better in the big cities, think again. My name is Kudakoshe Ian Chingami. Kudakoshe. Yeah, Kudakoshe, yes. Or Ian. Uh, oh, Ian. <laughs> like so many others in Cape Town, our Uber driver, Ian, migrated from another part of the continent in search of work. Cape Town is like New York, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's got family back home. Yeah, yeah. And they send money back. They definitely yeah. send money back. Ian included. He's got a mother and brother back in Zimbabwe. But sending them money? Far from easy. And you can't transfer money with the bank? It takes days or weeks. But in front of the bank, they give money. So it's a hassle. More than a hassle. It could be the difference between life and death. I like recently, I sent money to my mother. She was going to the hospital. So I, I wanted to send another to the Unable to wait for a bank transfer, Ian used a money wiring service. It was immediate, yes. But the downside? Does it cost money? 10%. 10%? 10%. It's a lot. Which brings us to a very interesting third option of sending money in Africa. To the bus. To the bus. Yeah, what is that? Bus. To find out, Ian took me to where it all goes down. The bus stop uh, that I was thinking about. You approach the driver, then you talk to him. Are you able uh, to, to assist me? Then the driver will say yes. And you wish good luck. The bus will arrive in Zimbabwe. And then I hand him the money. Yeah. And that's the agreement. That's the agreement, it's yes. Just it's a verbal agreement, yes. And you hope that he takes the money to where yes, he wants yes, to go. Yes, yes, that's true, that's true. And from there, well, things get a little dicey. And if the bus gets a flat tire... <laughs> Sometimes the delay, bus goes oh, down. Oh, no, the bus is going to be robbed. Robbed? Back in the car, I was still stunned. Yeah. It seems kind of crazy to go to a bus and hand over your hard-earned money yeah. to him and say, please bring this to my family, I trust you. Yeah. It's just something that most people wouldn't do. He just wanted to survive. I wish there was another option. Uh, that is safe and cheap to send money. All right. So you guys can see the scenario in Africa, many places throughout the continent is very different. So when I talk to friends from the U.S., from the U.K., Europe, um, you know, even Singapore, they're kind of like, oh, yeah, well, this is interesting. You know, maybe I'll get... You know, I'd like to maybe get a little bit, or, and I think it's a great place to obviously um, to diversify your wealth. But when you go to the African continent and to developing markets, even ASEAN in some places, um, there's a big opportunity for economic inclusion and empowerment here that we're seeing, where we're actually able to give people the ability to transact. I think more than 50% of people have uh, phones, and even if it's feature smartphones, they can access uh, internet, which means that they can actually access digital currencies and digital assets. On um, the African diaspora is also able to connect. So of course, as I said, I'm American, part of my family is of course in the Americas and the Caribbean. And it is something that allows people in the diaspora to be able to connect to people on the African continent as well, which is also uh, a pretty big deal. That was the purpose of the Wakanda blockchain meetups that we've been doing now for a few years and also uh, the uh, startup I'm involved in now to connect those groups together. So many blockchain projects you're gonna see, lots of businesses opportunities. Uh, there are lots of people who are doing a lot of exciting stuff. I was just in a FinTech festival this week here uh, in Singapore for, um, again, for African markets and a lot of exciting opportunities, a lot of investment is taking place now. So networking, creating global community is a very key thing uh, for people to really get the understanding of how they can connect. And as I call it, creating a digital Wakanda, right? The idea that you're able to benefit uh, not only the African continent, but also the other developing markets using these new digital currencies, cryptocurrencies in the blockchain. Let's go on. So you can see here that really banking the unbanked, right? So of course, uh, in Latin America, 
very large percentage of people unbanked in Africa and even higher in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, even higher percentage of people unbanked, actually in ASEAN where I'm located now, uh, there's a pretty significant amount of people unbanked as well. So basically in the non-Western markets, uh, what you're going to see is that there's a very large opportunity for what we would call fintech, blockchain-based, uh, decentralized finance type services to allow people to be able to invest in a farming project or a factory or uh, to expand their business. This is something that really simply has not existed uh, up to this point. I was talking with a friend of mine uh, from the continent, from Nigeria, and he was saying, well, you know, I want to invest in a factory. I want to put some more... Uh, you know, funds to expand my business. He said, but I can't because it's 25% interest. And I, I can only take 30% of the value of my assets, um, which if you are from the West is ridiculous, right? There, there's no way you can build a business with that high cost of capital. So what we really wanna do is we wanna be able to utilize these new technologies to allow people to be able to uh, get funding and finances and to build uh, these developing markets, Africa and other areas with uh, using the technologies that we talked about today. Let's go on. Yep. Okay. So Auspicious Blockchain, that's my company, Auspicious Agile Blockchain. Uh, and one of the things our mission really is to empower the developing world through blockchain and cryptocurrency projects. I'm going to talk about it a little bit at the end here because I want to just kind of talk about what we're doing. You can see that we're really connecting uh, basically Africa, the diaspora using blockchain. Uh, and uh, as a platform and an infrastructure and able to enable funding of different things like agribusiness and technology companies and infrastructure, right? Um, and so different markets like Ghana and Rwanda, uh, and secondly, South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, and to make company investments to support the mission of building Africa and Asia and growth markets. So the idea is to really be able to fund these things using uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, ScanPay is a company that we partner with and work with in California. Uh, base there. Um, and that basically is uh, enabling money movement back and forth into blockchain, into Western financial systems. And that's something that uh, actually my brother-in-law and the diaspora there actually works on with his business partner. So this is a uh, mission for us. Let's go to the next slide here. Oh, back. Yep. Facilitate the movement of funds into Africa to drive impactful investments for growth and opportunities that bring meaningful changes to the region and the aim of a better life for people in a brighter, stronger Africa. So we believe that there is a great potential to be able to close the financial gap uh, and the inability for people basically just to feed themselves, to move money to their families or to like the gentleman in the video there send you know, money to his mom for medical procedures. Uh, to be able to do that, utilizing blockchain is a very different use case than what we described earlier. Absolutely, there's a great ability to grow wealth with this, um, but there's also the ability to benefit uh, African developing markets as well, which is something that I'm excited about with why I've started Auspicious Agile and Blockchain. Let's go to the next slide. So for those of you who want to contact me, we'll just leave this up for a second. Um, and it's also recorded, but you can contact me there, jocoral.auspiciousagile.com, Auspicious Agile and Blockchain is my company. Uh, website is still going up, but you can find some of the blogs on auspiciousagileandblockchain.com. And there is on the right-hand side, I believe it is, a uh, email. Uh, you can write include the email list if you're interested in getting updates on what we're working on. Uh, and you can catch me on social media on, on any of the media forums there. Also join the Wakanda blockchain and cryptocurrency meetups if you're interested in Africa focused um, and African diaspora focused uh, blockchain, cryptocurrency, digital assets, and you wanna know how you can benefit in those markets. And of course the Growing Wealth Group is there for growing wealth across all markets and all sectors as well. Okay, so I'll leave that up for a few more seconds uh, and take any questions. Uh, do you guys have any questions specifically on Africa before we go to our general Q&A? All right, let's take it over to the general Q&A section then. So Kishi, don't want to facilitate there. Presentation be made available. Um, I think we can make it available. Kishi, do you have plans to post anywhere the presentation? Um, yeah, I was just messaging Matt and uh, Matt, uh, I, I believe you sent me a link yep. to, the, uh, to the presentation. Yes, yeah, so, so I sent you the link. Uh, feel free to, uh, to send it out to folks. Uh, yes, the deck okay. should be available. Uh, all the resources in it are linked as well. 
Um, and I think our contact is there. So if you had any questions that, that come up after the fact, um, you can you can definitely reach out. Hey, Matthew, let me right. suggest maybe let's do, um, I'm not sure if we can like PDF it up or something, because I think if it's the Google Doc, it'd be an editable one. So let's maybe PDF it up and give a link to a PDF version. Sure, no problem. Yeah, PDF would be even better. Thanks. Cool. Okay, uh, there was a question about stock to flow. I'm just going to answer that for the whole group here. Uh, maybe I'll actually share my screen because there was a good chart on that, and I'll let you guys type more questions if you have them in the uh, chat box. So the question earlier about stock to flow, let me see if I can get my screen showing properly here. There we go. Okay, I'm going to share my screen for a second, um, Matt. All right, let's give this a try. Okay, guys, can you see my screen? There should be a Bitcoin stock to flow model live chart there. Anybody see that? Yep. Okay, so what you're seeing there to the question you had earlier is the stock to flow for Bitcoin. This is interesting. I put the link, actually, let me type the link into the uh, chat box for anybody who wants to take a look at that. Zoom's doing some funny stuff here. But at any rate, um, if you look down here, the question about stock to flow, uh, basically for Bitcoin, they modeled it out and it was 27. That was previous 2020. 2020, it's now 52. Uh, and it will be 113 after the next halving in 2024. So um, the value will track that. I think they were saying, and I'm not deep into technical analysis, but I will tell you what it says here, which is I think that the value of Bitcoin previous to this last halving is about 10,750, which is about right actually. Currently it's sitting around 12,000. I'm not sure what a stock to flow of uh, wherever it was. I think we're at 62, we say. Um, sorry, 52, where that would leave us as far as value. But for those of you who are interested in that technical analysis, this is a really good article. Uh, let me see if I can get the chat window to come back up here and I will give you the link for this. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen if it will let me do that. And I am going to put that link in so you can get uh, that information, that article I thought was pretty good. Are there other questions? Okay, Gerald, I'll send the link to the PDF. Yep, so everybody will get that for the presentation PDF. Okay, other questions. What is it to benefit to send money via blockchain? If the sender needs to transfer money from a bank account to crypto platform, transfer wise quite fast nowadays, what is your view? Uh, Gills, I don't know if you can go on um, just audio. Can you elaborate on that? Is there, are you saying that the bank side you think is fast? Yes, okay. So uh, if you want to send money to someone in Africa, you need to transfer the money from your bank account to the crypto platform first, right? Because there is no direct connection from block, uh, from your bank account to the person in Africa. So you need to go first to the crypto platform. Mm -hmm. So you have one transaction to do there. After, when you send the money, uh, there is one, uh, I don't know, businessman somewhere in Africa who needs to meet your counterpart to give the money back. But if I'm using transfer wise, I can transfer directly also from my account to, to another account. So what is the benefit to use blockchain? Why transfer, why can go very fast nowadays? So you're saying from one bit, from cryptocurrency account to another or one bank account to another? No, from bank account to bank account because you gave an example of your sister, right? So you are able to send money directly from your cryptocurrency to your sister because you are having crypto cryptocurrency already. Mm -hmm. Okay, but got someone it. who are not having cryptocurrency need first to transfer the money from his bank account to crypto platform and from there to the, to, to, to the system. Yep, and I'll, I'll note obviously we'll stay for QA. Uh, anybody who's interested to stay for that, we'll be on for probably another 15 for QA. But uh, let me go ahead and answer the question. And anybody who needs to run, that's fine too. Thank you for joining us. Um, and I believe the link will go out for the presentation for you guys um, for the PDF. Okay, so Gil, going to your question, 
Um, for me, my scenario, right? I was sending funds from Nigeria, from family there, for my dad is in the US, okay? And to my sister for medical care. And we had to go through a ridiculous amount of paperwork, okay? To get any funds from Nigeria to the US. Uh, it took weeks and weeks and weeks. And even at the end of all that, we still couldn't get it done, right? And obviously when you're dealing with a medical emergency, you don't have that kind of time, right? Um, now, can I transfer funds from my Western bank account to my sister's Western bank account? Yes. Problem is the funds were coming from Africa, right? So they would not allow those fund to bank to bank transfers from Africa. Especially okay. okay. So I couldn't do that. That was not an option for me at that time. Uh, if you look at the guy in the video with his bus or whatever it was, right? Obviously that was Africa to Africa. A lot of people unbanked and they just don't have the bank account to do that. So that also precludes it. And then even if you do have a bank account, there's a ridiculous amount of paperwork I can tell you firsthand in terms of actually trying to get that money to move. I mean, it's my own family's money to take care of my dad's medical care. And yet it was a Herculean feat to do anything, right? Now you asked, I think somebody asked, how did my sister then, you know, move the Bitcoin into cash? If she did, she may have just kept it. But uh, if she moved it into cash, fiat money or dollars, she would just go to like in America, it's easy, in Coinbase or other ones, you just take it and pour math that you can do that as well, right? So you just take the funds, you move it to Coinbase, you connect it to your bank account. And sorry, if you're not speaking, can you mute? Um, and uh, you basically transfer to uh, your bank account directly from Coinbase, which is a piece of cake. Um, do consider taxes, of course, but uh, the bottom line is very easy once you have it in the Western market. Uh, and that's what our app actually, ScanPay, does is it allows you, it was originally designed for giving uh, for nonprofits. So you could basically move funds around in the Western system, but it can also connect into cryptocurrencies on the African continent or mobile money or M-Pesa or others as well on the African continent. But the key is that if you're in Africa, you're not getting easy access to Western markets. Um, that's just the way it is. Thank you. Yep. Other questions? Yeah, um, uh, this is uh, this is Kishi. Um, in regards to trading, are the big exchanges better at, at providing protection in, in case the uh, ex exchanges do get hacked? Um, and you know, similar to or, or analogous to uh, traditional investing in, in stocks, where your records, uh, your 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 basically your assets are you know documented, they're registered. So, you know, there's the hacking, hacking of, of your uh, uh, traditional uh, investments is, is basically impossible. So it, how, how can uh, crypto investors actually go about protecting their assets? Sure, yeah, let me just jump in and have a, a go at the first part of the question. Um, mm -hmm. So in terms of exchanges, um, so the large exchanges, they're, they, they're not, uh, crypto, crypto exchanges, they're not regulated. Right, uh, meaning that there there are no uh, guarantees that if there was uh, uh, your funds are lost, that there would be uh, any uh, uh, any any uh, returning of those funds, right, or any insurance to cover that loss, right. Um, so that's why there's inherent risk in trusting these exchanges, and you you have to really be uh, be be cognizant of that risk. To the, to the second point, that there's two, two other points, right? One is that's why, as John mentioned, and I looked at one over in the wallet section, that the, the best way to keep your funds safe is by keeping them with you, right? Um, so if you're not actively trading or, or you are holding your crypto, the best, the best advice would be to invest in a cold wallet or, or download software like a warm wallet that allows you to have access to your private keys. Um, so the, the reason why in a traditional exchange in stock, uh, you know, it, it's really difficult, I guess, to, to steal those stocks because it's documented who's the owner. With a crypto hack, what happens is uh, hackers will actually go into the exchange, get access to your private keys and transfer out your funds into another wallet. Meaning that even if you did have your private keys, you wouldn't have access, you'd have access to no funds, right? There's nothing left in your account, right? So they actually drain your account um, and drain your wallet. So again, the, the way to prevent this is uh, taking tolerating the risk in an exchange based on when you need to trade, uh, then moving your funds to a warm or a cold wallet where you have access to those private keys. Uh, ideal state, if you're looking for full security, is to invest in a cold wallet. 
and move your funds into that state um, and keep your funds offline, have your own private keys, and knowing that only you have access to those assets. Okay, thanks, Matt. Yeah, maybe I'll add on to that a little bit. Um, I think a general good rule of thumb is when you are in the digital asset or cryptocurrency markets, um, you are your own banker. So don't expect somebody else to be protecting um, your investment. You really have to take the extra steps to do that yourself. Um, now, I did mention earlier in the presentation that a lot of US banks and probably other banks as well are now doing custody. So if you really don't want to be responsible for that, you can let the bank's custody for you. Um, but I will caution you, as we like to say in the crypto markets, not your keys, which is means your private key, not your crypto, right? So if your bank has it and you're like, I really need that right now, they might go, sorry, we can't get that to you for another three weeks, right? So if you don't hold the keys yourself, yes, there's more risk in that. But if you don't hold your keys, hold your ledger or whatever it is like Matthew is talking about, it's not really yours in the terms of you're going to have to ask that institution to give it to you when you need it. And John, I, you know, I, I appreciate your, uh, you, you know, your cautioning of, of the attendees, but isn't that a little bit of a fear mongering given the, um, given, given the extent by which, you know, the traditional um, custodial services of, of assets, uh, the governance of, you know, over the last hundred years has worked. So, you know, it's, it's almost like, putting into question the, the, the credibility of the financial institution to be able to, you know, give you your, give you your assets on demand. And I, I can understand, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, the concerns in, in these markets are, you know, the, there's a lot of uncertainties, but it, you know, it's almost like saying, you know, you don't know if you're going to be able to withdraw your, your funds from your bank, or, you know, I'm not, I'm, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to, to, uh, to sell my stocks. If uh, if they're you know if I've got a, an account with TD Ameritrade, um, but are are you saying that's that would be the same for any crypto at at uh, Chase Manhattan Bank or Bank of America, or you know DBS Bank as well? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to give a short answer, which may get longer. <laughs> I'm going to give a short answer. <laughs> um, okay, so crypto came on the scene back in basically 2009 as an answer to the U.S. financial crisis. Okay. I was in the US for the financial crisis. It was not fun, <laughs> believe me, okay? A lot of us could not access finances, believe it or not. Um, we could not move funds like we wanted to. We couldn't withdraw what we wanted to. Um, so that, that did happen. Now, I mean, I'm not saying that happens all the time because obviously most of the time the banking system works fine, right, generally speaking. Uh, however, when we had that financial crisis back in 08, 07, 08, right, when we had the Obama election, everything was happening then, um, there was a lot of challenges accessing funds. Now, that actually was the reason the Bitcoin was created. So I, I will let people connect the dots as to why some people in this space, not everybody, but some people in this space are cautious of custodying their crypto with banks. And I'm not speaking to stock markets. I'm not speaking to regular bank deposits or anything else. I'm really just speaking to digital assets or crypto, right? So the, the motivation behind this space was in response to the 2008 financial crisis. Um, so I will, I will leave that as a short answer, though there may be more discussion. I think that's, that's a good point. And I, I have the reason, one of the reasons why I like, I like crypto as well is to, and Kichi to your point, I mean, in both points, right? I don't, I don't trust banks that much generally. Uh, I've been ripped off by banks a lot uh, over time, right? So, but there's the, the value in, in blockchain, the value in crypto is giving power to the people. Right, giving you full power to own, manage your own assets, right? And that could be a cryptocurrency as we go into tokenization of other assets. That could be asset classes from real estate, property, uh, art, et cetera, right? So it really, it really sort of democratizes the, 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 the ability for a single person to, to manage and own their assets. And I think that's sort of breaking with the, uh, the paradigm of, of needing a centralized institution to, to actually manage. So I would go back, if I was going to use a bank, it would purely be for convenience sake, because all it would take is for me to understand how to manage my, my crypto holdings to be able to manage them securely, right? So it would be purely for convenience. And, and to John's point, perhaps there are times in history where we've seen banks not uh, be able to deliver on send promises to, to, their, to their customers. So uh, definitely, um, I think I'm sort of in the middle here, but I, I just value the fact that blockchain and crypto allow us to have that choice.
Yeah, and again, I, I will note here, I'm not against banks at all. Um, I use plenty of banks, right? I'm just saying when you do decide uh, that you're going to maybe invest in digital assets or crypto, you have multiple options as to how you custody those. Um, and that's really up to you. Yeah. Well, great question, Kishi. Perfect. It's a good point. There's really sort of philosophical schools of thought on like crypto being like the, the libertarian savior of financial systems, right? <laughs> being, you know, this, this, this freedom of a financial system. Um, and then there's also the, the fact that it's, it's very new, it's very risky, um, and there, there's a need to enhance uh, security and, 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 and the ability to, to manage these, these assets. So uh, it's still a very new space and we're, we're, we're all figuring out how best to, to navigate it. Casey, did we answer your question or does there, you have a follow on for that? No, no, you, you did. And, and like you said, I, I, I think, you know, it, this, this whole discussion can be expanded uh, in, in, in greater lengths. Uh, and with, with varying, varying opinions, but, but I, I also understand, you know, in, in light of that black swan event that we had in 2008, in, individuals may, may be a little bit more um, reluctant uh, to trust the, the traditional uh, custodial services and, and look for more uh, individual based uh, uh, custody or arrangements. But yeah, yeah, you, you did answer it. Thanks. Other questions, folks? And feel free to turn on your camera if you want to. Um, at any rate, any other questions? Okay, John, Matt, I don't see any other questions coming up. And I, I'm also mindful of the fact that, uh, that we've run two hours. And um, uh, so yeah. what I wanted to do is probably just wrap things up now. Uh, you know, give anyone last opportunity uh, to ask a, a couple more questions, but I don't see any questions coming through. Um, having said that, what I'd like to do is thank John and Matt for a fantastic presentation. There's a lot of information that was presented uh, in, in terms of the, you know, the utilization uh, capabilities of uh, crypto, uh, the, the, the trading opportunities as well. Um, I, I think it's probably a lot more information than most of us could probably digest in, uh, in, in one session. Uh, but, uh, but I appreciate it and hopefully the attendees do also appreciate uh, the work and effort that you guys went into uh, to make this presentation uh, available. Thanks for having us, Keisha. Thanks for having us, everybody. Uh, All right, thanks everyone. I mean, Thank you very much. You know, they're doing this, but it's not just like entirely, I mean, it's free, it's just that what, Oh, is that a question or is that somebody just not on mute? I think some, someone was just not on mute. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I, yeah, I was, I was just going to say, uh, I, I will, um, uh, I'll make the, the PDFs available to everyone uh, on the WhatsApp group, on the Facebook group. John will make them available on the, uh, uh, the, the Wakanda um, uh, crypto page. And um, if anyone has any questions, you can also, you know, contact me through the, uh, the, through the evite. And if you have any follow-up questions, I can always uh, send those questions to Matt and John as well. Thanks for your time, everyone. Enjoy Thanks. Your All right, then. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.